Hello, and welcome to this webinar on radicalization to violent extremism, fixation and grievance fueled violence, navigating privacy, confidentiality and ethical challenges. A particularly warm welcome to all of you who've joined us tonight from the live activity. And judging by the number of registrations that we've had for tonight, this is clearly a topic of uh, great interest. We had over 2,000 registrations, which is quite extraordinary. A warm welcome also to those of you who are watching us later on a recording, and a very warm welcome, of course, to our panel, who I will introduce in just a moment. First, though, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands across Australia, upon which our panelists and our participants are located, and I'd like to pay our respects to their elders, past, present and future. Just to acknowledge the, the fact that the webinar has been funded by the Countering Violence Extremism Subcommittee under the auspice of the Australian New Zealand Counterterrorism Committee, supported by Department of Home Affairs and uh, produced by MHPN, Mental Health Professionals Network. And, and this is actually the last of a series of three webinars on these topics. And the broad purpose of this series of webinars is, is twofold, really. First of all, it was to, uh, I guess, increase your awareness and understanding of the issues surrounding countering violent extremism. And secondly, it was to support you to better identify and manage the threat posed by those who are at risk of this kind of behavior. So that's the kind of gist of... of um, uh, of what we were hoping to achieve by the series of three. My name is Mark, Mark Creamer. I'm a clinical psychologist in private practice and also a professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Melbourne. And uh, in my clinical work, and certainly in the days when I was working in public sector psychiatry, uh, I would from time to time come across people about whom I had serious concerns regarding their potential for violence. And I always found those very difficult and very challenging situations to manage. So I'm really pleased to be able to facilitate the panel tonight and to pick the brains of our esteemed panelists. So without further ado, let me introduce them. You've all had their bios, so I'll keep it very brief. First, I'd like to introduce Dr. Inez Rio. Uh, Inez is a very experienced general practitioner, and she is also a GP obstetrician at the Royal Women's Hospital. As well as seeing a very broad range of patients in her clinical work in a community health centre, she also serves on a number of uh, committees and advisory groups. So thank you very much indeed for joining us, uh, Inez, and welcome. Thank you, Mark. Um, at this point in, the, in these webinars, I usually ask people something light-hearted, you know, to break the ice and make people feel relaxed. But to be brutally honest, there's not a lot lighthearted going on, at least uh, for us here in Melbourne at the moment. So I thought instead I'd ask the panellists what, what they were missing or what they have missed as a result of the pandemic. So uh, to you first, in, is, uh, what have you missed or, or, or are missing? Um, I miss walking further afield than the hour I can around my home. So I've certainly become very much more familiar with the local streets, which I suppose is an upside. Um, the other thing I think that I'm missing is that sort of, I suppose that physical connection that you have with patients when you don't, you're not layered with PPE. Mm, absolutely, absolutely. It's, it's, it's prompted all of us to think about different ways of doing our clinical work, hasn't it? And some of it I agree is, it's not that comfortable. Anyway, thanks, Inez. Um, our next panellist is Professor Alfred Allen. Alfred is a clinical and forensic psychologist coming to us tonight from Perth. Uh, and Alfred has a particular interest in professional ethics, as well as in the intersection between psychology, mental health and the law. And he is also uh, someone who serves on a whole lot of high profile panels and committees. So welcome, Alfred. Thank you very much indeed for joining us tonight. Thanks for and, the opportunity. Yes. And of course, um, we're a little bit jealous of you over there in Perth because you're not quite locked down in the same way as we are. But no doubt the pandemic has uh, caused you to change some things or to miss some things. Is there anything you're missing or have missed as a result? I, I was dreading this a question because I really feel quite guilty to be standing here. Whilst I know you guys are all anchored down. So... Um, uh, I think what I'm going to say is really going to, I don't know how it's going to go down, but I, what I really missed was going overseas this year and hiking in Europe. Um, 
So I had to stay here, but I did go down to the south of Western Australia and had a really nice hike there, but wetter and colder and muddier. I, I think that's more than enough, actually. I'll probably be with mine. <laughs> but I, I can certainly see what you're saying there about the overseas trip, and I have to be honest that I also missed out on an overseas trip this June, July. Uh, thank you very much, Alfred. Our final panelist tonight is Dr. Danny Sullivan. Danny is a consultant forensic psychiatrist and executive director of clinical services at the Victorian Institute of Forensic Mental Health. As well as his medical degree, Danny has not one, but three master's degrees. I better make sure I get them right. He's got one in health and medical law, one in bioethics, and one in management. And he also holds academic positions at the University of Melbourne and at Swinburne University. Welcome, Danny. Thanks very much indeed for joining us. Uh, can we hear you? Yes, thank you very much, Mark. Um, I can tell you what I've, been, uh, what I've been missing, which is the chance to have another holiday at the end of this. So uh, as everyone else, I've missed a holiday along the way. But, um, but actually, it's the hope of a holiday in the future that we really miss. Well, we haven't given up all hope of a holiday in the future, Danny, I'm sure. But it's the one thing that's keeping me going, that one day we will be able to go on holiday again. Anyway, thank you. Thank you to all the panel. Um, so tonight's webinar is just a little bit different to our usual ones. Uh, but we are going to try and grapple with some of these difficult issues around privacy and confidentiality and ethics with this population. And we're going to use some hypothetical scenarios as jumping off points for our discussion. You've all received these uh, hypotheticals. Um, I should say that they are purely fictitious cases, but I think you'll agree there's a whole lot of stuff in there that if you work with this population will sound a bit familiar and lots of red flags for us as clinicians that would certainly uh, be worrying me and I'm sure would uh, worry you. So in just a minute, I'm going to ask the uh, panelists to say a few words. Then we're going to discuss the hypotheticals. And then at the end, we're going to come back to some of your questions uh, before we finish. Uh, and we hope that as a result of all that, by the end of the webinar, um, well, I guess there's a few things. The first is, it, I think, an increase in awareness of the issues. So we hope that you'll be more aware of the principles around confidentiality, privacy and ethics when you're treating or supporting someone who may pose a serious threat to themselves or others by way of radicalization to violence, extremism, fixation or grievance fueled violence. So an increased awareness of the issues. I think the second learning objective that we have today is something about the when. So something about uh, being able to describe the key indicators and circumstances for disclosure, when you can disclose, when you shouldn't disclose, to whom, uh, when you're working with this population. And the third learning objective for, for tonight's webinar really is about the how. So it's about um, having an awareness of the referral pathways and, and how to take appropriate steps, who to ring, who to get advice from and so on, if you're concerned about a person under these circumstances. So, um, oh, I've got some tech stuff I've just got to go through very quickly. Sorry about that. Um, so I'm sure you're all familiar with the tech stuff. Uh, you've got a purple button there which will open a chat box for you. That allows you to post comments and to chat to each other. The blue button is the resources button. And although I'm going to tempt you by saying there's some really good stuff in there, I would rather you didn't look at it now because that will distract you, but you can if you want to. Uh, but NHPN will send you a link to those resources in a week or so after the webinar, and you can look at them at your leisure. You've got a refresh button, an exit button, and you've also got the feedback survey, the yellow button, and uh, we really do want you to fill that in, but of course you can't fill it in until the end of the webinar. So I will remind you again at the end. So. I'd now like to ask each of our panelists in turn just to say a few very brief words. We're keeping it very brief this time. And it's really to help us get the context a little. And I've asked each of them to talk a little bit about where they go for information or support if they find themselves in these kinds of situations. So I'd like to introduce our first panelist again, Ines Rio, and ask Ines from a GP perspective, who would you talk to? Where would you go? How would you get support if you were confronted by these kinds of issues? So over to you, Ines. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, I will frame this in the context of the case that we have at hand. And essentially, you've got an unsolicited telephone call from somebody 
from an organisation with an initialisation that you've never heard of before um, that's telling you some fairly frightening things about one of your patients and asking you for personal and sensitive information from them to be handed over without their consent to be used for a secondary purpose. So every hair on my body is actually bristling at the moment thinking, wow, who are you? How can you ask for this information? Um, and what do I do in this situation? How can I know that this is actually a legitimate organisation, a legitimate person, a legitimate request, and that I'm actually required to, to um, hand over such information? Over to you, Mark. Or over to uh, you, Danny. Good. Well, um, sorry, I was just going to ask you, can you just talk quickly through your slides there? Do you, if, uh, do you, can you see the slide on the screen? I can, I can. So if we, if um, we just talk very quickly through those, and then I'll come back to that question that you, you raised then, because it's a very important one. Okay. So I suppose then I'll go through my thinking at that point. Um, certainly when they're actually speaking to me at that time, I'd probably be doing a little bit of an internet search to see who FTAC actually are. Um, and then at that time, you know, consistent with some of the... Um, Australian Privacy, oops, I've got to the wrong one, consistent with the Commonwealth Privacy Act, which we have, we've got, you know, 13 um, um, policy principles, and they actually talk about how and when you would transmit information. And certainly in this situation, I'd be asking them to actually provide a written request that includes, you know, when, what, how, uh, information I would need to provide at that point. So I'd be relying on a lot of the codes of conduct and the legislation in framing that response. Okay, lovely. Look, thank you very much indeed, uh, Inid. Um, so uh, I'm just checking. Slide. So, so in fact, uh, we did skip very quickly through a slide there, but it's got lots of um, resources on it. And just to reassure people that those resources will be part of the list that you'll get uh, at the end. But thank you very much, Inez. And, and, and I, I just go back very quickly to what I saw on, on the, I think it's the very first word of, of your um, first slide, which was colleagues, and, and perhaps just how important it is to feel that you can uh, talk to a colleague about this. We, would you say that's really important? Yeah, I mean, this is a highly complex situation and it's not something that you come across every day. So again, you actually have to structure what you, information you actually get in and also your support structures. So certainly in that case, I'd be requesting something that was written from the organisation that requested such information, asking me for things like, you know, what, why, how, under what legislation and why I shouldn't be requesting consent. But okay. then I would actually be talking to my colleagues and providing that information to the medical defence organisation in a de-identified form to say, is this a legitimate request and what, is, what, uh, what are my obligations in this circumstance? Absolutely, absolutely. And look, as I say, we'll come back to that first part of your comment there uh, in just a minute when, when we get onto the hypotheticals, actually, because it is a very, very important question. Thank you very much, Inez. Let's move on now and hear from Alfred uh, for a, a clinical psychology perspective and, of course, uh, someone who actually specialises in these areas of confidentiality and ethics. So, uh, Alfred, can I hand over to you and just talk a little bit about the context of how you would get support, where you would get support, uh, and so on, if, if, if you find yourself in this situation. Alfred. Well, I'd be mindful of the fact that uh, if I'm judged on whether I acted professionally or not by disclosing or not disclosing confidential information, the test is whether I did what the reasonable practitioner would have done under the circumstances. And this is an objective test and is therefore important, like Ines said, to consult other knowledgeable uh, colleagues. Attending webinars, is, this is another important one. And then to follow the right process. Now, on my slide, I've set out what I think uh, one would need to do under those circumstances. First of all, if you're an employee, uh, you'd look for the relevant policy, procedures, and protocols. If you're in private practice, ideally you should have such a protocol and a list of resources. And once again, um, going with this webinar, there's a really fantastic set of uh, resources. And then uh, think about people that you, and in your resource list, there should be people you could probably consult. And if you're in a state where there's a joint police and mental health team, that would be one option. 
the fixated uh, threat assessment center would be another one. Uh, and then just basically there's also obviously uh, for the psychologists, Australian Psychologi uh, Psychological Society's guidelines and resources like the ethical guidelines for working with clients uh, and also managing risk of harm. And I think that's basically uh, some other work web websites that people could uh, also look at. And that's where I'll leave it, uh, Mark. Thank you very much, Alfred. Can I just pick up, you know, I mentioned to Inez there about how we might talk to a colleague. Um, if in the context of professional supervision, clinical supervision, so if I'm talking to my supervisor, my clinical supervisor about these issues, do I have to worry about confidentiality issues or is that considered kind of within professional boundaries or whatever? So one, when one uh, will be talking to your supervisor, you should actually advise your clients in advance that you will be doing that. And oh, okay. the code, uh, the psychology code specifically also says that if you do speak to a supervisor, uh, that is actually one of the exceptions. Um, standard A52 actually says that's one of the uh, discretions that you have to disclose confidential information. So to what you're actually touching on is a really important thing, setting up the supervisory and consultation um, agreements very clearly and mm. probably doc documenting them and to make sure that every client understands that you will be talking to a supervisor or a consultant. Okay, cool. I, I, to that, oh. Please do, Inez, yeah, yeah. Yeah, just to add to that, um, Mark, I think it's preferable when you actually engage um, patients in the first instance and you start collecting their information, their personal and sensitive information, that it's actually clear in a general practice setting that that's actually information that's actually held by the practice and is available by all the GPs. And certainly most general practices work within that multidisciplinary framework. And the other thing that's actually, I think, very advantageous is to think about the fact that out, you often use that information outside that immediate general practice to work with other people within a multidisciplinary team as well. Okay, so that's a very good point. And, and I, I probably will come back to that a, a bit later because, as you say, Alfred, it is a, it's a complex area, but it's one that, as clinicians, we have to deal with all the time. Um, anyway, okay, thank you very much, Alfred. Let's move on to Danny. Um, and perhaps, now, uh, Danny, if we could ask you for a psychiatry perspective on where you go to get information support. I have also asked Danny, though, to just foreshadow a couple of the issues that we're going to go on and talk about. So I'll ha hand over to you, Danny. Uh, Thanks very much, Mark. Um, look, the psychiatrists and psychologists and general practitioners don't actually have particularly different perspectives on confidentiality and privacy. Um, the, the fact about these matters is that you can look at the codes of ethics and you can look at your codes of conduct and you can look at the law and they give you guidance, but they don't give you the answers because every single scenario is different uh, and these scenarios are all complex. Um, one of the things that's really important to recognise is that these scenarios, um, they challenge uh, your duty to your client versus your duty to act in the public interest. Uh, FTACs, or Fixated Threat Assessment Centres, exist in some form in all of the states and territories of Victoria, or at least there's access to those services. And they're a, they're a type of service which shares information between police and mental health under very clear guidelines. And the reason for that is that the people who are of interest frequently have a mental health history which is relevant and frequently have been or need to be in contact with mental health services. So when we look at uh, FTAX, what they offer is the opportunity for police and mental health services to share information in order to both avert a public threat but also to link a person to treatment or to effective intervention. When we're dealing with these confidentiality issues, we're, we're dealing with that conflict between what we see as a public interest and what we see as our client's best interest. And of course, when you listen to us all speaking and when you're thinking about your own practice, what we're thinking about, first of all, is our client and their, their welfare. Um, and one of the things to point out is that there are no straightforward solutions to this, um, but in many cases, we want to ensure that our clients don't hurt themselves or hurt other people because that's a bad outcome for them as well. From the point of view of a psychiatrist, first of all, we have a duty to our client and that's a duty based in our relationship. 
Um, it's the overarching duty, it's a prima facie duty, that is, it's something that we have to think of as the primary duty, but that's not to say that it can't be overridden by other competing demands. And sometimes there are statutory duties in, in some jurisdictions, but generally those duties are um, not to breach confidentiality rather than to, um, to, to clearly set out situations in which you must breach confidentiality. So in the United Kingdom, um, some of the FTACs were associated with a duty um, to teachers and health professionals and others uh, to notify police of concerns about violent extremism or terrorism. And that was a very controversial duty. We don't have such a duty, um, but what we might have is a, a moral obligation rather than a legal one. So the codes of ethics are really important to look at, but they're, they're the beginning of the discussion, not the end. And we've all spoken about discussing with colleagues. Um, you don't want to be having that thought, which colleague should I ring? When you're confronted with this dilemma, you should already have that situation set up. You should have a, a network of people that you rely on and trust and can speak about um, at, at short notice about these problems. And what you might want to do is actually look at the Code of Ethics and in the discussion, in fact, they're not going to give you the answer, but in framing the questions to them and discussing the scenario and getting their further questions and feedback, you'll get a bit of advice on what you should do. And that's a really important way of thinking about it. The reason it's important in these situations, and we'll come through this with the scenarios, is there's this concept in threat assessment called leakage. Uh, and leakage is well recognised as a way in which people who pose a threat um, communicate that threat to other people in various ways, to friends or family or to health practitioners, um, not necessarily explicitly, but in enough ways to give concern, just as suicidal people sometimes signal their intentions. Um, so that communication should give rise to you to a concern about what to do. Um, and I suppose the take home message to foreshadow what we'll be saying at the end is really to um, not to seek some explicit guidance on what to do, but rather to think about who you can share the discussion with and to communicate about the ideas that arise from your concerns. Because at the end of the day, if your client commits an offence, they go to prison for a long time or they're dead or they've done something very awful and it's not a win for anyone. You've got one more slide there, if you I've got one more slide. Um, in terms of the people to speak to, um, well, I say that I, I often take these sort of telephone calls from people I've never met before, general practitioners and, and other clinicians. Um, so public mental health services and public um, mental health services in all states will probably have some ability at least to answer your question or tell you that they can't answer the question. You've got indemnity organisations, although sometimes these are very rarefied and special um, questions, but they can at least give you the satisfaction of knowing that you're doing the right thing and that you won't be um, persecuted for it. But really, the most important thing is your colleagues. It's your supervisors, your peers, and the people that you normally go to to seek ideas about the difficult situations we all face from time to time. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed, Danny. And that's, that's an important point, isn't it, to end on there, that... Uh, if, if people take nothing else away from tonight, take away this, that you can't, you don't have to do this on your own. In fact, you shouldn't be doing this on your own. Get support, get help, and so on. Thank you very much to, to, to all our panelists there. Now I'd like to kick off the broader discussion and start exploring some of these uh, hypotheticals. And I'm going to ask the panel members to just jump in at any point if they want to disagree with what's being said or add a different perspective to it. I should say at the outset that I've been very impressed with the number and the quality of questions that we've received from our participants. And I would love to go through and answer each one in turn, but I'm afraid I can't. We haven't got time to do that. I'm confident that we'll cover almost all of them in the hypothetical discussion. And we're also going to uh, finish up with uh, uh, addressing a few more of them at the very end. But if we don't uh, get round to your particular question, please bear with us. So now I want to talk about these scenarios. Um, if you've got them in front of you, uh, uh, the, those of you, our participants at home who have the resources that were sent to you, I'm going to talk about scenario one to begin with. So here we've got a situation where the FTAC has contacted you, the GP. Uh, we're going to say the GP in this case, but you could be another allied health professional or health professional. But in this case, contacted the GP about one of your patients, Mr. S who is a 17-year-old male with high-functioning autism and OCD. He's very socially isolated, spends a lot of time online. Parents don't supervise his internet use. And a clinician from the FTAC, so that's going to be probably a psychiatrist or a psychologist, from the FTAC has contacted you saying that they've got some information, some reliable information, that Mr. S has been speaking with ISIS online. 
uh, and that he's got some pretty nasty plans to blow up uh, a local police station and to behead civilians. And worse than that, they've found uh, some weapons and some paramilitary uh, paraphernalia in his home. And so the clinician, the FTAC clinician, is ringing you as the GP uh, or, or the, the health provider to get some further information so that they can do their risk assessment. You've had no previous dealings with FTAC. You're confused about uh, what, what to expect and, and what to share, what's appropriate for you to share and so on. Uh, and I think this, this scenario highlights several issues that, that are um, that perhaps speak to the difficulties that we as health providers may have when we're working with patients who've got this kind of terrorist label on them uh, and issues, of course, about what information should and shouldn't be uh, revealed. It also raises issues about um, autism, which I'd like to come back to. I will come back to at the end. But for the moment, let's put that on hold. In is, I'm going to put you in the hot seat because you are the GP after all. Um, so uh, I guess the question is, the FTAC clinician has rung you. Um, can you share information with them? And, and do you have any idea what information you can or can't share? So I might rewind to what I talked about about five or ten minutes ago, Mark, and just say, mm. look, as a GP, this is actually quite a frightening telephone call. It's an unsolicited call from somebody that you don't know about with, from an organisation that you've never heard about before asking you to actually, with quite a lot of knowledge, it seems, about disturbing knowledge about a patient of yours, asking you to send, uh, provide information to them, um, secondary purpose of that information with no consent, um, and you're sitting here wondering, is this a legitimate telephone call? Um, is this a legitimate request? Um, and how do I deal with that? Now, hopefully your practice has a mechanism and all practices should have a mechanism whereby they actually deal with such requests, whether they're with consent or without consent. And certainly you'd be asking for a written format of that. You'd be asking exactly what the request was for on the behalf of whom and why consent wasn't actually sought and how you're best to actually um, transmit that information as well. So that's where we'd, I'd be starting. I'd be asking for a formalised okay. request. Okay. Now, um, let's just wind it back a little bit, though, because you're a bit concerned that you don't even really know what an FTAC is and, no. and so on. So let's check it across to Danny. Um, let's say that, that um, Innes rings you with that exact question, Danny. You know, what, what is an FTAC and, and perhaps what are my responsibilities here? What would you be advising her? Well, it's quite understandable why someone might do that. It sounds a bit big brotherish. Um, it's quite appropriate. Uh, I, I have to say that I've put the FTAC number into my phone and it's saved there so that if I need to dial them, they're there, so I know they exist. Um, but I'd be telling her that FTACs have been around in Australia for... Um, some years and, and overseas for many years, um, they exist because um, there are necessary circumstances in which police and mental health agencies need to work together to prevent serious harm from happening to the community. Um, and um, obviously that's a balancing act, but I'd be saying you need to think about the cooperation that you need to, to give, you need to think about your client, and uh, I'd be saying give the information that you can, um, give the minimum amount necessary, but, but think carefully about... Um, what might happen if you do or if you don't. Um, and I'd be advising her to do the same thing that Inez has already said, which is to speak to colleagues and speak to your indemnity organisation if you have more concerns. One of the things that's important is, of course, this is sometimes very time critical, um, and that's, that's obviously um, worrying for clinicians, and that's why you need to perhaps have some knowledge in advance and be able to think about what you can provide early on and what you might provide a little later once you've had a chance to reflect and think. And um, just sort of picking up on one of Innes' concerns, is it legitimate to ask FTAC to put that in writing? You're saying a lot of these are time critical. Is it legitimate for the GP to say, I'm not going to do anything until you contact me in writing? Absolutely. Okay. Good, good, good. All right. Um, so do you feel any more comfortable now, Innes, about what you might or might not share about Mr S? And I think, yes, I do. And I think that Danny is right. I mean, you're in a position where you don't want to actually, where you want the information that you hold about that person 
to actually be a part of the bigger picture to make an informed decision with regards to the risk that that person might pose to themselves or to other people. So you're not in a position where you want to be a barrier, but you are in a position where you want to ensure that it's actually a legitimate request from a legitimate organisation. And you also want to have a concept about why, whether consent is appropriate in that circumstance, because I think you should always start off with the concept that your patients you work with collaboratively with, that you have an honest and open relationship with, uh, and that consent is the basis that you work from but obviously in cases such as this, consent might be um, uh, not a good idea. It's a thorny issue, isn't it? I want to bring you in on something else, Alfred, uh, now, but can you just uh, quickly say something about that? I mean, it, it's ludicrous to be insisting that we get consent from the client in this particular case, isn't it, or, or not? So the Privacy Act, uh, premises is that we should always get consent unless it's impractical or unreasonable. So that is one of the conversations that Ines should probably be having with her colleagues is would it be reasonable for me to ask uh, my client's consent? And obviously uh, Ines is also going to be a very good judge of that because she knows her patient and she knows the type of relationship she's got with her patient. Okay, okay. Um, let me take it up one level, Alfred. Um, we've been talking to the clinician from the FTAC. So, you know, we've got, um, we're talking to another health professional and so on, and we, we perhaps feel a bit more relaxed, I think I would, doing that. Uh, but can that person, can the clinician in FTAC talk to the police in FTAC? Is it just assumed that anything I tell the psychiatrist or the psychologist in FTAC, they will hand over to the police? I'm not an insider, so I can't tell you for sure, Mark, but my uh, assumption would be that the GP, sorry, that the clinician will talk to the police because there are several provisions in the Privacy Act that could apply here and may even allow that, allow that clinician to speak to the police. So I think um, always assume that the clinician you're speaking to may share information. And going back to something that Danny said a bit earlier, so always be conservative, only release the information that um, you need to, um, and uh, be, yeah, and just assume that this is not gonna end with a clinician. Okay, I think it's a very reasonable um, assumption to be carrying. If I come back to you, Danny, because why don't we then just miss out the middleman, as it were, what if, if the, and I would feel much more uncomfortable in this situation, what if the police were to ring me or to ring Innes and ask for information about the patient? Would I be in the same situation? Because at the moment, I'm only going to tell the clinician who's going to tell the police. Should I tell the police straight away? Is it legitimate to do that? Oh, look, I think that's a great question, Mike. Um, let me reassure you that in FTAX, there are very strict information sharing uh, protocols, um, and it's not a, a free-for-all exchange of information. So... Um, clinicians who work in FTAC are still bound by, in our state, the Mental Health Act, so they can provide information when there's an imminent risk of harm to self or others, um, but they have to sort of meet that test. They, they can't simply pass the file across. And information that is discussed in clinical review meetings between police and mental health uh, really has to be used for the client's benefit. So um, in that situation, I mean, I think you can be satisfied that there are robust protections um, but that's not to say that, um, that the information won't somehow come into the hands of um, police and might in the future be used in, say, a prosecution. You can't be sure of that. So I think what you need to do is be circumspect about what's offered. If it's a police person ringing, well, that's a normal situation. Um, we deal with that all the time in compulsory treatment, in mental health, in family violence, in other situations in which um, the police have a legitimate interest in um, seeking information. And we have to think about whether the, the risk posed outweighs our duty of confidentiality to the client and each of those situations is individual. Sure. Okay. Well, while I've got you... Sorry, Ines, were you going to say something there? Yes. Yes, I was just going to add the fact that you are essentially talking between clinicians as well. And this is a really highly unusual circumstance for that individual general practitioner, but not such a highly unusual circumstance for that clinician in VTAC in FTAC. So there's, there's information and there's a capacity build that that clinician in FTAC will actually provide to you. 
I suspect that they will say, look, it's a really good idea for you to document in your notes this letter, to actually document in your notes that consent was not sought for these particular reasons, that you've weighed the, uh, the risks and the benefits in this, or in, in this scenario and, tra and specifically asked for um, what information is required. So I think that there is also that conversation that happens between clinicians and they can guide you. And I think as a GP, I would be requesting that guidance both from the FTAC clinician and as you said before, from medical defence and peers, supported hopefully by some of my policies and protocols in my practice. It's a very good point. It is, and you've alluded a couple of times there to something that I want to pick up later, which is about notes and what you put in your notes. But hold that thought because I'm going to come back to it in a minute. Um, Danny, Innes is getting a bit frustrated. Let's face it, Mr. S is her patient after all, and yet the flow seems to be just one way. It's FTAC asking the clinician all the time. Can Innes reasonably expect some um, details from the police about the investigation, things that would help her as a clinician to better work with her patient? Can it be two-way? Yes, it can, but it's not necessarily an expectation. So. For instance, um, the police may well relay information which might change your clinical um, appraisal of the situation. Um, so for instance, the police may have capacity to um, interrogate social media databases or to, to look at what the person has been doing. They might provide some information which you as a general practitioner are not privy to and which drastically changes your estimation of the situation. Um, so in situations like that, um, certainly if you're ambivalent about providing information, you might, um, you might ask really what the risk is posed or why it is that they have that degree of concern. Um, and it's, it's quite likely that the clinician or the police in that situation will provide information to justify why it is that you might wish to convey further information. Um, but of course, as the general practitioner, as the clinician, you're still thinking at the heart of it all about your client's best interests. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, thanks for that, Danny. Um, Inez, I'd like to come back to you and I'd like to um, slip out of the uh, hypothetical just for a moment, wind it back a bit. Let's assume that FTAC had not become involved. Let's assume that Mr. S had just told you in the course of a consultation uh, that he's been talking to terrorists, he's been talking to ISIS online. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you've got the answer, but I'll ask the others if you haven't. Are you under obligation to report that, to say something, or how would you handle that if if Mr. S told you he'd been talking to ISIS? Um, I, I think that, can I just go back one little piece, Mark, and which is the, the sort of second arm that I wanted to talk about with Danny, which is the question about your, uh, your clinical care of the patient, which is what you're extending to now. Mm -hmm. um, the issue is also from a GP's point of view, you've told me some really disturbing things about my patient and I'm concerned about that person's clinical care. Have I under-treated that person? Have I appropriately picked up information about that person? Have I under-managed that person? Um, and so that extends to that question now of FTAC not being involved, that the person's talking about that issue of um, perhaps um, um, in the scenario where he's, where he's speaking about terrorists. And, you know, I'd be very worried with the previous FTAC scenario because I have a very disturbing picture of him already. But if I don't have that FTAC scenario, there's a, a, a spectrum of worry, essentially, that's informed by the history of what's happened to him before. You know, is this a recurring psychosis where he hasn't acted on it before? It's been easy to manage. He's been adherent. Um, has, he, is he, has he been violent before? Has he acted on things? Is he planning things? Um, is this an escalation or a stable environment? Is there associated substance abuse? What other medical practitioners are involved? So there's not a yes and no answer to this. It's actually a spectrum where I'd be thinking about where is he at the moment? What's the safety netting? What's the enabling? What's happened in the past? And how can I look after him moving forward? Great, great, great answer. So we're taking into account a whole lot of different information in, in trying to decide in this particular case, at this particular time, is it appropriate? Can I just confirm something you said earlier, Danny? Uh, I'm, I'm right in saying, am I not? I think you said that actually we're not mandated to report suspected terrorism, uh, unlike the UK. Is that what you were saying? 
you're on mute. I keep doing that. Um, it, it is an interesting observation, but um, you know, it was a very poignant issue in the UK where parents described their dilemma: Do I notify the police that my child wishes to go overseas and fight for ISIS and possibly die? Um, and in doing so, do I then ensure that my child is in prison for a terrorism offence? So there's a dilemma that you really can't answer as a parent. Um, so as a GP, I really appreciate um, Inez's primary concern for her patient, but also recognising that the consequences of the sorts of behaviours that people are talking about here um, don't necessarily end well for them as well. Um, but coming back to your initial question, no, I don't believe there is any primary duty. Yeah, OK, interesting. OK. Uh, Mark, Mark, uh, sorry, Mark, yes, can Alfred. I just come in there? Um, I, I agree with Danny, there's not a primary duty. There are legislation in some states about terrorism. I think in New South Wales specifically, uh, that may come into play here. So, uh, but there's no, uh, I agree, there's not a, a general legal obligation. Yeah, okay. Lovely. I don't know what um, that, Danny... Uh, yeah, no, that's, that's fine. I, w I want to stick with you, actually, Alfred, because um, strange it may seem, and I don't know how they did it, Mr. S's parents have got hold of your phone number, Alfred, and they're giving you a ring because they want to know what they can do to block um, inappropriate content from Mr. S's computer. What are you going to advise them that they could do? I think this falls a bit out of my level of competence. Um, if I know the, that they know that FDAC is involved, that's probably one uh, uh, resource. But otherwise, um, I would probably refer them to the Living Safe Together and the Mental Health um, Practitioners Network website, where there are some information that may be useful. But um, I think that's my primary uh, mm. field of competence, if I can put it that way. Fair enough, fair enough too. Okay, um, before we leave this case uh, and move on to the next one, I would like to come back to you, Danny. Um, we hear that Mr. S has autism, high-functioning autism. We hear a fair bit about possible links between autism spectrum disorders and violence. I guess I'm wondering whether there's any truth in that. And I should say that several participants picked up on this and sent in questions. And one of the questions was actually whether a person who is on the spectrum would be dealt with differently. But can you just give us a very brief riff on, on this um, link with autism? Okay, well, I, I think the first thing to point out is that people with autism are not more prone to violence. There may be some reactive violence in situations at home or domestically, but, um, but I think that's very different. But what is of interest is that if we look at um, violent extremism, we certainly see, I think, an over-representation of people with autism spectrum disorders. Um, and it's probably a combination of uh, the uh, fixation and the, the way in which people become quite rigidly drawn into a particular topic. Um, in some cases, their naivety and gullibility. So there have been certainly a number of situations in which people with autism spectrum disorders have been um, exploited horribly by, by people who are wishing to use them as a, as a pawn in, in some sort of terrorist game. Um, the, the third thing I think to point out is that, um, is that often people with autism spectrum disorders lack the capacity to, to really weigh up in the balance and think about the pros and cons of what they're doing in a logical and rational way and are prone to, to perhaps um, coming into a particularly one-sided view of things. In terms of um, whether they're dealt with differently, um, there is no doubt that there is a degree of sympathy um, in the way that the criminal justice system will deal with a person if they commit an offence and they have an autism spectrum disorder. And certainly in particular, Ian Freckleton has written quite a lot on this in um, psychiatry, psychology and law. But the main thing to point out really is that, um, is that if, if a person with an autism spectrum disorder is drawn into this sort of situation, although they might be a victim, what we're also dealing with as clinicians is our cognitive dissonance because we're thinking about them as our patient and as the person with the problem. And it's really difficult to reconcile that with a person who then might go and in, engage in some act which is antithetical to our view of them as a, a patient needing healthcare. Hmm. Okay, and, and would they be managed any differently if they were on the spectrum? Uh, managed by the mental health system or managed by the criminal justice system if it goes No, on? I'm thinking more that the, um, the F, well, 
the criminal justice, I guess, the FTAC police, you know, would they be managing this case differently if they knew that he... Yeah, well, FTAC, yep, F FTAC is certainly keen in situations like this to ensure that people with mental health needs or um, other mental disorders are appropriately linked to services, particularly if that can be um, a way of circumventing something bad from happening. Um, so the, the primary um, focus is upon linking people to treatment that can prevent um, outrages to community safety. Um, so they'd be dealt with, I think, initially, certainly, um, through a mental health spectrum and, and there would be efforts to ensure that the person was in receipt of the appropriate treatment um, in the hope that that would prevent anything disastrous from happening. But, but obviously part of the situation you're dealing with is to, um, is to stop that from happening and the police will intervene if that's a real risk. Yeah, good, good, good. Okay, that actually leads us very nicely into our next scenario. Um, and uh, this is a slightly different one, although it is the same kind of issue in the sense that FTAC is contacting or FTAC clinician is contacting the GP. In this case, uh, the um, in this case, let's assume you're a female GP contacted by an FTAC clinician about Mrs. J, who is a 55 year old woman, one of your patients, and you've known her for a long time and you're not aware that she has any mental health issues at all. Uh, but they've learned that Miss J has a history of erotomania and she's had in the past uh, quite powerful delusions involving a city councillor and she has recently shifted those attentions to an MP. Uh, she's been, and well, she was initially assessed by FTAC as moderate risk because Miss J had alluded to getting rid of the MP's family and uh, partner and children. Uh, but it's now been elevated to a high risk because um, they found out that she's got a gun license and gun club membership. Uh, Mrs. Ms. J has refused to speak to FTAC or to the FTAC clinician. So they're liaising with you, their GP, um, and they uh, they think that she needs urgent treatment for her delusions. She's got no insight and uh, and so on. So I guess that what this does demonstrate, and it's kind of something you were alluding to there, Danny, it does demonstrate that um, FTAC is not just about protecting VIPs, although I'm sure they would love to protect the MP in this case, uh, but it's also about in, uh, identifying someone who's um, got, got a, a long-standing, previously un unidentified mental health problem. Uh, but it also highlights similar issues to our last case, I guess, about what can be said and what can't. And I just whizzed through those very quickly. Now, I should say uh, for our tech colleagues, I've lost two of the pictures there, but I'm hoping that um, Inez and Alfred are still with us. I can still see Danny. Right, um, I'm still here. You are good. That's all I need to know. Um, okay. So um, I guess three questions about what information can and can't be shared in Ms. J's case. And I know they're going to be quite similar to last time. But if I start with you, um, Alfred, um, how much information can we share with either the, the police or, or the FTAC clinician um, uh, by the GP? Can, are there some guidelines about how much information we can share in this case about Ms. J? It seems to me like FTAC is better informed than the GP in this case. Yes, um, yes. So I, I think it, it depends. Uh, okay, so let's just go back to the general rule in... Uh, the, in this case, so the Privacy Act says that we can only use information for the primary purpose, we collected it, and if there's a secondary, we either need to get consent or then we need to decide about the threat and so forth and whether there's a reasonable belief. Now, this doesn't seem to apply here, but what and I think Innes would say, well, look, actually, FTAC is asking me to help this patient. Um, I've got a duty of benefic beneficence to help here. And if I can get into a conversation with uh, FTAC and the clinician at FTAC, we can maybe help uh, the client. And therefore, I would say that um, the information shared with the FTAC clinician would depend on what would be the, the best interest of me helping my patient under these circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, just keep in mind also, and Ines has said this as well earlier on, that. Um, the Privacy Act also uh, says that when possible, we need to get consent. Uh, it's practical and reasonable. And once again, uh, depending on my relationship with this client, I, I may have an open conversation with this client and say, look, you know, 
um, this is the situation and this is, these are the risks for, for you and where do we take this? Mm. What's our plan mm. of action? Can I just ask you, uh, and it may be the same answer really, but one of the participants asked, I thought, a legitimate question, Alfred, about um, what about the next of kin? As a clinician, as a GP or a psychologist or whatever, can I share information with the next of kin? I know that's uh, one of the real difficulties, and it would depend in the, uh, as a, uh, but as a general rule, not with an adult mature person, unless you believe that uh, you've got a, a duty of care towards a, a, that uh, next of kin. Uh, but that's a really int a difficult one and a very, um, I think one would have to look at the circumstances. But as a general rule, I think you should rather be very cautious about sharing information with the next of kin. Yeah, sure. And it is a situation that we come across a lot, isn't it? In uh, not so much in this, I'm not thinking so much in this violent way, but treating adolescents or perhaps, you know, uh, young adults and the parents are so upset, so concerned and they want to know what's happening. And you have to say, I, I can't, I can't, um, I can't talk about it, unfortunately. And it's, it's very uh, tough for the parents. I, I, yeah, Mark, um, I think it's probably the people, uh, family members of people with mental illnesses would say, that that's one of their biggest um, frustrations, mm. mm. uh, but there's a there's a balance to be to be found here, and and also keeping our our patients involved and uh, maintaining their trust in us. Yeah, quite. Did you want to come in there, Ines? Just quickly. Yes, I just I think that that was a really important point, especially for the first case because he was 17, and it certainly crossed my mind as a general practitioner that in the clinical care of that 17-year-old, whether you'd actually involve his parents. But really, a 17-year-old would be regarded as a mature minor, and as I said, as as Alfred said, I think that it would be somewhat tricky. But it doesn't mean you haven't got a bit of wriggle room. I think about um, inviting the parents in and perhaps getting a more fulsome picture of what's happening to that young man at home, even though you might not be transmitting information to them, you might be garnering some information that gives you more of a context about that person. Okay. Um, Danny, can we, um, do we need to be concerned about, in this case, warning the GP about it, or is it something we can wash our hands of and just make sure, just let FTAC or the police make that decision? And I can't I see you, Danny. I'm here. Sorry, go on. Yep. An, an important one because it does involve also the local area mental health service. And once more, you know, this is not it's not necessarily frequent for GPs, but they are used to dealing with people who require compulsory treatment under the Mental Health Act or who decline treatment. Um, and it's always a you know it's a tenuous balancing act between preserving your relationship with the patient while ensure that you act in their best interest. Sometimes when they're not able to do so themselves. Um, and in a situation like this, um, I, I would be working with the Area Mental Health Service. Um, just coming back as well to the, the question about how much information can be shared with FTAC when the, um, when the person of interest is, is declining to speak to them, um, you can still disclose information which is not necessarily harmful to the patient. So you can, for instance, indicate whether or not you have had concerns about their mental health, whether or not they've had treatment recently, whether they have spoken about this person and whether they've, um, they've had treatment. Um, so you can certainly, these aren't things that are necessarily of um, prurient interest to other people, but they're certainly very helpful for FTAC in terms of thinking about whether or not um, they need to intervene and, and with what level of, um, of intervention. They're also helpful for an area mental health service because it's likely you might get them to make a welfare check or you might notify the CAT team based on those concerns. Okay, and good. I was, and I, uh, go on, Inez, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I was going to say something very similar. I mean, in some ways, actually, FTAC have provided you with a lot of information whereby you need to actually fairly assertively manage this um, this woman. And you do that in conjunction with other specialist services outside your practice. So I'd certainly be involving the Area Mental Health Service. Um, and as you garnered more information from that woman, again, you would actually do that balancing act. Does there come a point where the disclosure of that information um, is required for the safety of her, the public, or in the best interests of the public with or without her consent. I, I, so I that do might like happen with time. 
I like the point that, that I think all of you have made, actually, which is, is very often, uh, if we're serious about the best interests of our patients, actually, we will be uh, helping to prevent them from doing something stupid. You know? It is, um, you may not know this, but you're about to go off on maternity leave. I'll, uh, I'll let you decide how likely that is, but let's <laughs> assume that you are. Um, and your replacement is a male doctor. How much are you going to share with the new doctor, who may, of course, become a target for Ms. J's delusions? Uh, how much would you share with him? How much would you I think warn I'd be very, um, I think I'd be quite frank with regards to what the history has been with regards to her delusions and, and, delusions and, and her fixations, um, and also talking about her management plan moving forward. And I think that he needs to have that information to keep himself both safe, but to also understand what's actually happening with regards to her mental health and well-being. I think you can often say more than you can write in notes, um, because in a conversation with a colleague, there's some nuances that can come out that perhaps um, you don't document. But I think that I'd be both dispassionate and frank with him. Well, I'm very glad you mentioned that issue of notes because I want to pick it up and I perhaps turn to Alfred first, but I'd be interested in all of your views. But they have to be very quick because time's going very fast. Um, this issue of notes, um, that we know that what, what we write in our notes is potentially subject to FOI and certainly subject to subpoenas. And my personal experience is that my clinical notes are getting subpoenaed much more often now than they ever were in the past. So it is something we need to be careful of. Um, do you have any, any thoughts about that, Alfred, about what in this kind of material we might put into the notes? Well, I've got no doubt you've got to put in your notes that you've been contacted by uh, FTAC and that you need to, uh, your notes should be so that if, even if you didn't know you were going to go on leave, if somebody else had to take over, you didn't have an opportunity to talk to that person, that person should still, from your notes, be able to uh, get a picture and be able to take the necessary steps. So it's very difficult. You know, we can talk hours about note keeping, but one of the things is you keep notes for the ongoing continuous uh, treatment of your patient, and therefore it means that if you're not available and somebody else has got to take over, they need to be able to look at your notes and form a picture that can allow them to proceed and also protect themselves. Mm. Fair point. And the Good. legislation has re the legislation's recently changed. I think I think it was last year, Alfred, wasn't it, to actually incorporate that clinical handover as an important component of medical notes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, as I say, time is running out. I want to have a very quick look at scenario three before we uh, finish off with a couple of questions from participants. Um, so uh, scenario three is a little bit different because in this case, uh, FTAC haven't contacted you. It's you uh, as the GP that's concerned uh, about Mr. D, who is a 34-year-old single male with a diagnosis of chronic schizophrenia. Mr. D's mother contacts you because she thinks that he's been attending right-wing rallies. He's been making racist, anti-Semitic anti -Semitic comments. He's been uh, hanging around with outlaw motorcycle gangs and so on. Uh, and that he claims he's hearing voices that are telling him to burn down a mosque. He's smoking a lot of uh, cannabis and so on. Um, in his, you're the treating GP. Um, what would you do in this scenario? The information's just come from his mother. Would you raise it with Mr. D? Would you contact FTAC or what would you do? Uh, you're on mute. Sorry, I was just saying similar principles to before, Mark. I'd actually um, somehow get him into my room and have a conversation with him um, and determine what I felt was the risk in this scenario and maximise his clinical health and well-being. In determining the risk of this, um, this, the risk that this young man has to himself and others, I'd be putting the puzzle pieces together of the information provided by his, um, by his parents and also any past history that I have. And certainly, if I had concerns, I'd be, you know, knocking on the door of my colleagues and having some conversations with other people outside my room. Mm. 
Sure. Okay, good answer. Good answer. Now, if you do want to do something, I'll go to you, Danny, for this. This is just the kind of um, the take home message, I suppose, or one of the take home messages. If if we are concerned about someone, if Innes is concerned about Mr. D, uh, who do you think it's best to report it to? Do we go straight to FTAC? Do we ring our local police station? Do we? What do we do? Several participants have asked this question, so it's an important one. Danny, what do you think? Oh, look, in this scenario, and, and it's made much more straightforward by the fact that this man has a chronic severe mental illness, um, I think you would go to your area mental health service. So thinking about this, FTAX is set up really to focus on people who have fallen out of treatment or have become estranged from treaters, um, or in some cases where treating services um, don't perceive that they meet the threshold. This is a man who's likely to be taken up by a mental health service, and it's much more straightforward, whereas... The other two scenarios raise cases where the local mental health service might not see that they have a, a necessary duty to um, to intervene in that situation. Yes, OK. So but you're, 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 you're the psychiatrist in the area of mental health service then, if you want to pass the buck. You're, you're the psychiatrist there. Are you? What are you going to do? He's got these delusions. Of, he's got these voices telling him to burn down a mosque. You're still not going to contact FTAC? You're just going to rely on the, our capacity to treat his delusions? Uh, look, or his I, hallucinations? If I were treating uh, Mr. D, I'd be um, engaging him with our crisis team. I'd be looking at his amenability to treatment, his capacity to consent. Um, it's likely on the basis of the scenario that he'd be in for a compulsory admission. Um, and I'd really be seeking to explore his beliefs. I'd want to know how delusional, how fixed, whether he'd made any approaches or preparations. And I'd be thinking carefully with, um, with our service, with our leaders, um, with managers in the service about whether we made a notification to police about that. I probably wouldn't be thinking necessarily about FTAC. I'd be thinking about contacting the police if I thought there was a very significant risk of that um, uh, occurring. Because the fact of the matter is, FTAC really is he's not going to be particularly interested if he's firmly engaged in treatment with us and we see that we have a duty to him. Yeah, that's very interesting. But when you say contact the police, and I'm thinking of the you know, the clinician sitting out there in, in a rural area or whatever. Are you t talking about just ringing up the local Bobby, the local police station? No, no. Of course, most services will have a, a liaison person. They'll be able to speak, um, you know, in an informal basis about what to do about situations. In a situation like this, um, obviously, this might well respond simply to assertive treatment, to engaging yeah. him with, uh, with medication and getting him off the drugs and removing him from his peers. But if, in fact, he's got a house full of explosives, he's got fireworks, he's got, um, you know, uh, incendiaries in his house, he's got maps of the local mosque and you can see that sort of information, um, then I, I, as a clinician, as a psychiatrist, would be very um, reluctant to be carrying the risk that I could simply discharge him home without the fear that he would do something dire um, and, and cause harm to the community. Yeah, yeah, great. Okay. I think that in, in reviewing those hypotheticals, we have uh, answered most of the questions that came in from you, from our participants. There's a few that we haven't, um, and they raise a couple of interesting issues. So let's see in the last five minutes or so whether we can address a couple of these. And I'll go to you first, uh, Alfred, if I could. Um, one, of, one or two, in fact, it's a few participants uh, asked about whether we risk uh, being accused of professional misconduct if our concern is dismissed. So, um, you know, we're accused of breaching confidentiality when actually there was no risk there. Are, are, are we at risk of professional misconduct? So, um, as I started off, actually, professional misconduct uh, de depends on what the reasonable practitioner would have done under those circumstances. And basically, uh, generally, uh, doing consulting um, following the guidelines, following protocols, following legislation, uh, one would probably be uh, not be found to be unprofessional. Mm. Okay. Can I add to that, Mark? Please do, Danny, yeah. Uh, certainly, if, if you look at cases in Australia which have focused upon negligent discharge from hospital where a harm happens to someone um, or the duty of people like police to prevent suicide, uh, people acting in good intention tend not to be found guilty of uh, professional misconduct. Uh, I think it's, it's fair to say that if you lay out your reasoning, the pros and the cons, you talk about the measures you've taken to seek other opinions and you come out with your decision, you might have made the wrong decision in retrospect, but the fact that you've thought through the options is really going to defend you against uh, claims of misconduct. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. That's, that's reassuring to people, I think. 
Um, OK, another question that uh, participants have sent in, and I'll give this one to you, Inez. Um, the question is really, what, what's happened to our professional relationship once we've made a report? Can we maintain a trusting relationship with our client, having you know, spoken to FTAC or, or whoever? Uh, what do you think? I mean, and, and is it repairable? Is it reparable? Repairable? Um, I think that the answer is yes, you certainly can. And I think that one of the premises that you need to work through is the fact that your therapeutic relationship is based often on um, trust and based on a um, um, on your desire, your fiduciary duty to that patient. And so I think that where you can, you are honest, but in some circumstances, you can't be completely forthright with regards to the transfer of that information, depending on the risks associated with that. But if you start off with the premise of, I will try to get consent. If I can't get consent, then I will try in a circumstance to inform the person that I've actually um, um, notified FTAC or whoever the organisation is. And if I can't do that, then I'll clearly understand why and try to to repair or to continue with that relationship ongoing. I mean, hopefully as that person becomes more well, we'll develop insight into that and why that was actually done. And as we've said before, both for the interests of the public, but also for their own interests. Absolutely. Okay, uh, Danny, um, Inez is saying there that, that she'd make a clinical decision, but if she could, if she felt it was appropriate, she would tell her patient that she had been talking to FTAC about him or her. What would FTAC think about that? Would FTAC be concerned that we are telling the patient that they're being investigated? Well, look, they certainly might, but you can ask them. You can ask them what information you can uh, reveal to them, what, it, what it's appropriate for you to say that you're aware of. Um, they may well have um, police reasons not to disclose information. For instance, they could reveal that the person's under surveillance or that their social media is being monitored. Um, I, I would check carefully with FTAC what you're allowed to say and what you weren't. But I think that the, um, the general sentiment is, is a really correct one. Where possible, you work with your patients and that tends to be the better thing in the longer term. Um, if you can't work effectively with them, then you obviously have to escalate to different levels. And uh, presumably, uh, whether or not it's going to put you under increased risk is also a consideration. You know, if I tell my patient that I've had contact with FTAC, whether that puts me at risk, that would be a consideration also, of course. Yeah, absolutely. All of these and, things are... Yeah. I think you it need is. to distinguish between the discomfort that you might face from uh, from breaching your, your patient's relationship. But the point we made earlier about notes, the other reason you take notes is to protect your colleagues when you're on leave so that they know what's been going on. Yeah, yeah, quite. Uh, Danny, while, while I've got you there, this is a... <laughs> It's a straightforward question. I'm not suggesting that the answer is straightforward, but I think it's a legitimate thing for people to ask. And that is, what are the key indicators of progressing from ideology to action? Is in, that uh, in a few minutes? <laughs> yeah, well, um, less than a few minutes. One, you've got max, yeah. Well, look, um, th there's no particular indicators, but you're talking about fixation. You're talking about the level of, um, of interest. You're talking about whether the person appears to have a balanced life with other aspects to it or whether they've become preoccupied with a particular grievance or idea. Uh, and the other aspect we mentioned earlier is leakage. So when they start to communicate um, plans or to make um, indications that they're preparing for something, those are, those are concerns that they're moving from thought into action. Mm. Good, good, good. Okay. That's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll come to you, Inez, but I'd like actually everybody's opinion on this. This is going to be my last question. And that is about what, what do we do to protect ourselves? How do you protect yourself and other staff while also, I guess, maintaining confidentiality? So you don't want to tell the whole clinic that Mr. D has made you or whatever it is, Mr. S has these problems. How are you going to protect yourself and others while still maintaining a, a level of confidentiality. I'll throw it to you first, Inez, but I'd be interested in others thoughts. I think that there's the protection about against the, uh, your professional protection against burnout and then your physical protection as well in this circumstance. Mm. And I think that the, prote uh, the, the protection against burnout is actually about having colleagues, about sharing these burdens with other people. 
about being really clear what your roles and responsibilities are and what you can do and what you can't do. Um, and I think that they're incredibly important things to have in complex situations such as this and in complex working environments. I think with regards to um, your, the physical well-being of you and your staff, I think that you do need to work in conjunction with the organisations in that if you're, if you're concerned at that level, this person is obviously somebody who would be involved with law enforcement and I think that you need to take their advice um, about issues pertaining to safety of you and your staff in those instances. Sounds very good advice. Do either of the others have anything they would like to add to that point? No, nope. I'll okay. just echo what Inez says, a problem shared is a problem that's really much easier to deal with. Very much so. And that's a theme that's come through over and over again tonight, isn't it? And uh, yeah, as I say, it's a really important message. Okay. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. There's such fascinating topics and, and I had a whole lot of questions there that I was hoping to get to, but we haven't quite had time. But I think we have explored um, a whole lot of the issues and complexities around these kinds of cases. So I hope you felt so too. To finish up, I would like to ask each of our panelists if they've got any very brief take home messages uh, for our participants, if you like. Um, so Ines, let me start with you. Any, any brief take home messages? Uh, mute. Mm. Sorry, many, many of these complex situations are a balancing act. And I think that you need to actually think, I think it was Danny or Alfred that said before that you need to write the pros and the cons. And I think if you have a structured approach, and I think that you need to actually, this is not, these are not common scenarios in general practice, but they're very concerning. And you need to share that burden with your colleagues and other people to come to a supported best response. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Don't do it on your own. Um, Alfred, any take home messages for our participants? Mark, I think the bigger picture is that people consult us and confide in us because they trust us to help them and keep their private information confidential. Um, and sometimes we need to violate that confidentiality, but we should always try to do it only if it's strictly necessary, only provide the information strictly necessary to provide and only to people who need to know it. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Great. Okay. Thank you very much indeed, Alfred. And Danny, uh, finally, you some take home. Look, I, I don't have much different to offer. The, the discomfort that's engendered by these ethical dilemmas um, really is an indication, firstly, that there are no perfect answers. Um, these are wicked problems. These are things that um, you need to do the best that you can. And the, the way that you do that um, most effectively is by increasing the, the likelihood that you can communicate with other people about what you should do properly. Yeah. Yeah, good. All right, thank you very much indeed, and thank you to all three of you. Uh, somehow we've gone back in the slides and I need to be further ahead, so just bear with me. Um, just a final couple of closing comments then before we wind up the webinar. First thing I'd remind you is that MHPN uh, supports multidisciplinary practitioner networks all across Australia uh, where people can get together and share tips and uh, advice, they can share professional development activities, somebody to talk to. Uh, and as we've been saying consistently tonight, having someone to talk to is absolutely crucial. So um, can I please uh, suggest that if you're interested in, in joining one of those networks, that you um, get in contact with MHPN. In fact, in the resources that we're going to talk about in a second, um, you will find out how to uh, get involved in one of those networks. Um, the second thing is, as we said early on, that there are some great resources associated with tonight's webinar, not only uh, what our speakers have provided in their slides tonight, but I have to say that um, the material provided by Home Affairs is brilliant. Uh, there's really simple, detailed stuff about who to contact, how to contact them, phone numbers and so on, plus there's a whole lot of really good fact sheets for um, for health professionals. They're really good stuff, so I strongly recommend that you have a look at that as well. Finally then, um, I would like to ask each of you to complete the exit survey. It really is very, very important. So before you log out, just make sure you complete that so we know how we did today. This was the final webinar, as I said, in a series of three that were commissioned by 
uh, Department of Home Affairs. And I would like to thank them for commissioning this series because I think they've been great. I've really enjoyed facilitating them. And I think we've had some really interesting and valuable discussions for clinicians in the field. So thanks to them uh, and thanks to MHPN, of course, and Redback for the tech stuff. Uh, thank you very much indeed to our panelists for tonight, who I thought were brilliant. Thanks to Innes, Alfred and Danny. I thought their, their contributions were magnificent. And thank you very much, finally, to you, our participants, for your involvement and engagement and so on. It really is uh, your involvement that makes it work so well. So I hope you found it valuable. Thank you very much again to everybody and good night to all.